Hey guys, Tyler here. In previous videos, I've analyzed Star Trek The Next Generation seasons one and two, examining their themes as well as their contributions to the broader lore of the franchise. For many fans, TNG's first two seasons stand apart from the rest of the series. Gene Roddenberry had a tighter grip on creative decisions, and a bevy of other factors gave it a more surrealist vibe. But unfortunately, this led to a lot of awkward moments. Though not a universal opinion, a large contingent of the fandom considers season three to be when the show got good. But despite how I may have titled this video, I am not here to review the remaining seasons, per se. Instead, I'd like to do what I set out to do from the beginning, provide some insight into the narrative choices made, and catalog key additions to Star Trek's canon. And maybe I will offer my opinions on some of these episodes. By the way, there will be spoilers in this video. With that, let's get started. Before we dive into the episodes themselves, I want to offer a little background on Season 3. One of the most evident changes is that Gates McFadden is back as Dr. Beverly Crusher. As I mentioned in my Season 2 video, McFadden claims she was fired from the show for being too vocally critical of decisions made by the studio, Paramount. She was replaced for the season by Dr. Catherine Pulaski, played by Diana Maldor. The writers considered the Leonard McCoy-like Pulaski character to be a failed experiment, and an extensive letter-writing campaign, as well as support from the likes of Patrick Stewart, led to McFadden being rehired. Season 3 also sees some promotions. Geordi LaForge is promoted from Lieutenant to Lieutenant Commander, and Worf is promoted from Lieutenant Junior Grade to Full Lieutenant. The crew receives some new, looser-fitting uniforms with a raised collar and no shoulder striping. At first made of spandex, the uniforms are eventually made of wool to relieve back pain. Props and models like the Type 2 phasers, tricorders, and even the Enterprise D herself are redesigned with more detail. Even the opening title sequence is changed. This time, instead of a grand tour of the solar system, more abstract astronomical phenomena precede the ship's arrival on screen. And another change that I, as an artist and student of filmmaking, appreciate is that Season 3 introduces a new cinematographer, Marvin Rush, who replaces Edward R. Brown and continues to work on Trek for the next 16 years. Rush's visual style, which includes a bright, vibrant color scheme as opposed to Brown's more subdued lighting, heavily alters the look of the series from this point onward. By the way, before we continue, I do want to take a moment to let you guys know that according to my analytics, over three quarters of the people who watch these videos are not subscribed. Come on guys, what are you doing? Hit that subscribe button so you won't miss my future uploads. Now, moving on. Many changes to TNG that I mentioned earlier are first evident, of course, in the season three opener, Evolution. Written by Michael Piller, who went on to become head writer of TNG, the episode sees Wesley Crusher accidentally create an intelligent race of self-replicating nanites that threaten the ship's safety. Astrophysicist Dr. Paul Stubbs, accompanying the Enterprise to observe the explosion of a red giant star, wishes to exterminate the nanites as they are interfering with his research. But after Data is able to establish communication with the nanites, they make it clear that they are simply acting out of self-defense and mean no harm. As a result, they are resettled on the planet Cavus Alpha 4, another installment in the decades-long arc as to how Wesley Crusher might actually be God. The episode features an argument between Wesley and his mother about how Wesley is taking on too much responsibility. Look, I have done everything that everyone has asked of me and more. And how can you know? You haven't even been here. 
I don't know, man, this just really strikes me as the kind of interaction that Gene would not have liked in season one. We love character conflict, good writing. The episode also continues another theme that Trek has been exploring practically since its inception, the relationship between organic and artificial life, or at least life forms of different kinds. Stubbs' belief that it's absurd to refrain from eradicating the nanites lest they be intelligent may seem unfederation-like, but it's a natural human reaction that stems from fear of the unknown. This theme is one of many that is also explored in episode 2, The Ensigns of Command, in which the Enterprise must relocate human colonists on a planet claimed by the Shiliac. Foreshadowing somewhat the Maquis conflict later on, these humans refuse to leave their homes despite their planet, Tau Cygna V, having been ceded to the Shiliac in the 2255 Treaty of Armands. Except, Unlike the Maquis situation, these colonists accidentally crash-landed on Tau Cygna V 22 years after the treaty was ratified. Data is sent down to this Class H planet to convince the colonists to leave, and he's called a walking calculator by the colony's leader, Goshevin, another sign of disrespect. These folks' resistance to evacuation is understandable, but ultimately it is misguided. They are placing themselves in unnecessary danger as they are no match for the Shiliac's weaponry. Picard and Troy try to negotiate with the Shiliac to buy some more time to conduct the evacuation, while Data strives to battle Goshevin in the marketplace of ideas using reverse psychology. Though doomed, your effort will be valiant. And when you die, you will die for land. While some colonists want to leave, these people are in the minority. Colonist Adrian McKenzie helps Data realize that actions speak louder than words, and Data vaporizes the flow of water from the colony's aqueduct. He does this to demonstrate that the Shiliac will do far worse, convincing the colonists to leave. By the way, the Shiliac are a non-humanoid species that I've wanted to talk about for a long time. But that, that may have to wait for another video. Keep your eyes peeled. Speaking of powerful beings, Episode 3, The Survivors, introduces the Dowd, another race of godlike aliens. In the episode, we learn that at least one Dowd, posing as a human male named Kevin Uxbridge, traveled to Earth in the early 2330s and fell in love with a human woman named Rashan. The two got married, eventually moving to Rana 4 after a few decades. When the Enterprise first arrives at Rana 4, however, all that's left is the Uxbridge's house and a plot of land amidst an eerily barren landscape, evoking similar vibes to classic TOS episodes like the Squire of Gothos, and the Savage Curtain. After the crew suspects that Kevin had something to do with the other colonists' disappearance, Kevin reveals the truth. Not only is he endowed, I mean endowed, but he is also a pacifist. He refused to use his powers to fight back against Hushnak invaders. But after Rashan was killed, he retaliated by wiping out all of the Hushnak. And not just the ones invading. I killed them all. All Hushnak. Everywhere. And of course, he was only keeping Rashan alive as a memory. Ultimately, the Enterprise crew allows him to continue to live out this fantasy in private. It's only appropriate that this First Contact episode is followed by another one, Who Watches the Watchers, which is also a quintessential Prime Directive episode, when a Federation observation team on Mintaka 3 is plagued by an explosion, a member of the native intelligent species, the Mentakans, is injured by proxy. The Mentakans are a Bronze Age society with proto-Vulcanoid physiology, one of numerous such races throughout the galaxy. The Prime Directive's rigidity is perfectly showcased, in my opinion, when Picard asks Dr. Crusher why she didn't let the Mentakan man, Liko, die to reduce cultural contamination. A very Picard question, I might add. But it doesn't matter since the cultural contamination has already occurred, effectively. Despite attempts to erase his recent memory, 
Liko remembers everything about his visit to the Enterprise's sick bay when he returns to the planet, and his daughter Oji corroborates this. The Mintakans go on to form a religion with Picard as their god, and they threaten to harm another Federation observer to please Picard. Obviously, this has to be stopped. Picard convinces the Mintakans that he and his comrades are mere mortals like them, just with more advanced technology. And someday the Mintakans civilization might join them among the stars. This strong start to season three is followed by a string of episodes that, with a couple exceptions, are not as highly rated from a critical standpoint until about the mid-mark of the season. But they do offer some key developments in the lore, as well as character development. You know, that thing. Episode 5, The Bonding, explores the theme of loss as the crew helps young Jeremy Astor, get it, Astor, deal with the death of his mother on an away mission. The episode ends with Worf, who led the away team, accepting Jeremy into his family with the Klingon Rushdai ritual. In episode 6, Booby Trap, Geordi seeks help from a holographic recreation of Dr. Leah Brahms, one of the designers of the Enterprise's warp engines, to escape a thousand-year-old booby trap in space. Let's just say things get a little bit frisky, and Brahms shows back up later on. Episode 7, The Enemy, introduces, or rather continues, the story arc of political tensions between the Federation and a Romulan Empire that has ended its 53 years of isolation. This arc continues with Episode 10, The Defector, in which a censured Romulan admiral tries to warn the Federation of an oncoming Romulan attack, only to realize that he has been deceived. In The Enemy, Geordi is trapped with a Romulan centurion in a dark cave on Galorndon Core, and the two must work together to escape. While at first the injured Romulan mocks Geordi for being blind, saying that in his society Geordi would have been terminated, his visor comes in handy to identify a neutrino source acting as a beacon, which will signal the Enterprise to beam Geordi up after he alters its frequency. Meanwhile, on the Enterprise, a second Romulan is in critical condition in sick bay, but refuses a ribosome transfusion from Worf. No skin off Worf's back since he wouldn't donate ribosomes to a Romulan anyway. Worf's decision allows the episode to explore themes of bodily autonomy. The Romulan in sick bay dies, but the centurion on Galorndon Core is returned home alive, greeted by Commander Tomalok, who himself goes on to become a recurring character. Episode 8, The Price, introduces the Barzan, who have become relevant on the interstellar stage due to the discovery of a stable wormhole in their system connecting the Alpha and Gamma quadrants. If that sounds a tad familiar, you can probably guess how this episode ends. As it turns out, Unlike with the Bajoran wormhole, the Gamma Quadrant terminus of the Barzan wormhole isn't stable. Shifting between the Gamma and Delta Quadrants and stranding a Ferengi scout vessel in the latter. These jokers show up again in the Voyager episode, False Prophets. As you can probably guess, bids for access to the Barzan wormhole break down after its instability is revealed. This episode also explores the ethics of using empathic powers, as bitter on behalf of the Chrysalians, Devanani Rall is one quarter Betazoid and uses this to his advantage in negotiations. When Deanna confronts him about this, he basically says, right back at ya, forcing her and the audience to re-examine the ethics of her role in aiding Picard's diplomatic negotiations. As a side note, the Barzan are said to lack manned space travel, though obviously they have a sufficient level of technology to warrant communication with other alien civilizations, a demonstration of how technological progress isn't always linear. Ethics are front and center in at least two other episodes of TNG's third season. The Hunted and the, in my view, severely underrated 
the high ground. The former deals with issues like the treatment of prisoners as well as veterans as the Enterprise becomes entangled in an extradition dispute over Angosian soldiers who have been chemically enhanced. And the high ground is an early Trek exploration of terrorism as Dr. Crusher is kidnapped by Ansada terrorists on the planet Rudia IV. Her captor, Finn, is the leader of a rebel faction vying for independence from the planet's eastern continent. Finn justifies many of the rebels' actions by pointing out to Crusher that the ancestral hero of her homeland, one George Washington, was himself considered a terrorist by the British Empire. The difference between generals and terrorists, Doctor, is only the difference between winners and losers. You win, you're called a general. You lose. You are killing innocent people. How much innocent blood has been spilled for the cause of freedom in the history of your Federation, Doctor? How many good and noble societies have bombed civilians in war, have wiped out whole cities? But much like Starfleet turned Maquis leader Michael Eddington, despite legitimate grievances against the oppressing power, Finn is legitimately putting his people in danger. Rather than using conventional transporters, the Ansada use dimensional shifting tech that is slowly damaging their cells. The cellular effects of dimensional shifting are further explored in Season 3 of Discovery, as well as in shows like Fringe, which by the way featured Leonard Nimoy as Dr. William Bell. The way this episode plays out is different from the way that media about terrorism has played out after 9-11, with a closer analog to the Rudian conflict being, perhaps, the struggle of the Irish Republican Army. And indeed, when Data talks to Picard about terrorism, he mentions the Irish reunification of 2024, an event that, while unlikely to actually occur anytime soon, is eerily timely given the politics of the UK post-Brexit. Ultimately, Finn dies for his cause, but the seeds of change on Rudia IV are planted after a child soldier lowers his weapon. The plot of helping resolve a civil conflict is also explored in the episode The Vengeance Factor, in which the Enterprise helps bring two factions of Akamarians to the negotiating table. After helping Q get his powers back after being kicked out of the continuum in Deja Q, Return that moon to its orbit. I have no powers! Q the ordinary! Q the liar! Q the misanthrope! What must I do to convince you people? Die. Oh, very clever, Worf. Eat any good books lately? And solving a murder mystery in A Matter of Perspective. Commander, don't please. She's lying, that never happened. TNG's exploration of wartime tensions continues with the iconic episode, Yesterday's Enterprise. In this episode, the Enterprise C emerges through a temporal rift, creating an alternate timeline in which the Federation is badly losing a war to the Klingons. The Enterprise C was present at the historic battle of Narendra III, in which they attempted to defend a Klingon outpost from attack by the Romulans. But unlike in the correct version of history, in this alternate timeline, the sea is lost before they can help stop the assault on Narendra III. Tasha Yar returns as the butterfly effect erases her death on Vagra II, and she still serves as tactical officer in Worf's absence. Guinan's Elorian physiology signals to her that something is seriously wrong. Wesley even has a proper uniform. He's not supposed to get one of those until episode 24, Menage a Troy, when Will, Deanna, and Luaxana are abducted by the Ferengi, and Picard must recite Shakespeare to get them back. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? The, the context for that makes it sound less ridiculous, I promise. But back to yesterday's Enterprise, Guinan must convince Picard to send the Enterprise C back through the rift to finish the battle even though they will certainly die, thus preventing the Klingon War and restoring the Two Powers Treaty of Alliance. Yar goes with them, having learned that she's not supposed to still be alive, and helps restore the timeline. Yar's decision will have significant ripple effects, something that we'll explore later on. It's an earth drink. Prune juice. 
Warriors drink. The next two episodes deal directly with family. In The Offspring, Data creates, well, an offspring. After copying his own neural pathways into a new android body, Data lets his child choose its gender and appearance. The android selects the image of a human female, and Data gives her the name Lal, which in Hindi means beloved. Lal at first has much trouble with basic motor skills and, of course, social interaction. He's biting that female! But learns very quickly, even surpassing Data's programming in some areas. The episode invokes questions about the ethics of letting machines self-replicate in this manner, a question not lost on Starfleet as they send an admiral to order Law's relocation to the Daystrom wing on Galar 4 for further study. There's a legitimate question as to whether or not Law actually would be better off leaving Data as he can only do so much aboard the Starship Enterprise to properly parent her. But ultimately, the prospect of being forced to leave against her will causes Lal to suffer a cascade failure due to intense fear. That's right, she experiences emotion. One, briefly, and a negative one at that, but it does occur. Alas, while Lal's life was not meant to be, her memories do remain with Data. We must strive to be more than we are, Lal. It does not matter that we will never reach our ultimate goal. The effort yields its own rewards. Familial loss of another kind is at stake in the next episode, Sins of the Father, which introduces Worf's brother Kern. He is sent to bring Worf to Kronos to challenge their father Mog's discommendation for having aided the Romulans in the attack at Kittimer that orphaned Worf and Kern. The truth is that it was Duras's father, not Mog, who is the traitor, but Worf accepts discommendation to save the Empire after Kern survives an attempted murder by Duras. After being abducted by unnamed aliens studying human behavior in Allegiance, Picard takes a vacation in the episode Captain's Holiday on the pleasure planet Risa. We first learn of terms like Horgon, a totem of Rysian sexuality displayed by those seeking Jamaharon. But Picard's vacation is interrupted by two Vorgons seeking the Tox Utat, a crystal-like device that can halt all nuclear fusion inside a star. Originating from the 27th century, the Tox Utat is allegedly buried somewhere on Risa, and the legend brings archaeologist Vash and her Ferengi competitor Sovak, played by Max Grodenchik, aka Rom, to Risa as well. Picard ultimately thwarts the Vorgon's plan to obtain the Tox Utat by destroying it. Picard and Vash's romance is rather unparalleled in any previous installment of TNG, or, well, any subsequent installment for that matter. So it should be no surprise that this is definitely not the last we'll be seeing of her either. Episode 20, Tin Man, is a classic episode dealing with a cosmozoan or space-born life form called Gom2. This creature, perhaps the last of its kind, basically intends to commit suicide by hanging out near a star that's about to go supernova. That is, until Betazoid first contact specialist Tam Elbrin, who feels rather misunderstood by society, merges with Gom2 before they depart for, well, parts unknown. Episode 21, Hollow Pursuits, introduces Lieutenant Reginald Barkley, an incredibly neurotic officer who lets his holodeck fantasies, in which he recreates members of the crew, interfere with his duties. But while Barkley's antics annoy the crew, I am the goddess of empathy. Cast off your inhibitions and embrace love. He does help solve a problem that threatens the safety of the ship, earning his crewmates respect, and giving him the confidence to delete his deepfake porn. I am the guy who writes down things to remember to say when there's a party. And then when he finally gets there, he winds up alone in the corner, trying to look comfortable examining a potted plant. 
in episode 22, The Most Toys, Data is abducted by a collector, played by Saul Rubinek of Warehouse 13 fame, who fakes Data's death in a shuttle accident. This episode is actually quite effective at portraying the abuse of a captor against his captive. Why don't you put on these lovely new clothes and go sit on the chair? I must decline. Behave normally. I knew you could hear me. Come along, Varia. <laughs> You're much more fun than Pazzo's new toy. <laughs> You'll regret this. I'm going to miss you. And it also shows how the crew would react to Data's death, capturing its pure senselessness, much like Tasha Yar's. Episode 23, Sarek, is the second major recurrence of a character from the original series on The Next Generation. The first, of course, being Dr. Leonard McCoy in Encounter at Farpoint. The episode explores the theme of aging as Sarek is diagnosed with Bendai Syndrome, a rare disease that causes Vulcans to lose control of their emotions. Continuing the themes of life, death, and change in between, episode 25, Transfigurations, serves as another early showcase of ascension in the Star Trek universe as the Enterprise crew witnesses the birth of a new life form, the Zalconian energy being. Oh, and this is also the first episode in which Chief O'Brien comes into sick bay with a dislocated shoulder after kayaking on the holodeck. And finally, episode 26, the best of both worlds, brings back the Borg, who have wiped the Federation colony at Jury 4 off the map. This episode introduces Commander Shelby, Starfleet's tactical expert on the Borg, who accompanies the Enterprise as they prepare for a response. Shelby poses a threat to Riker, who continues to be pressured to accept a promotion to become captain and leave the Enterprise, leading to some fantastic dialogue between the two. You disagree with me? Fine. You need to take it to the captain? Fine. Through me. You do an end run around me again? I'll snap you back so hard you'll think you're a first-year cadet again. May I speak frankly, sir? By all means. You're in my way. How terrible for you. All you know how to do is play it safe. I suppose that's why someone like you sits in the shadow of a great man for as long as you have, passing up one command after another. When it comes to this ship and this crew, you're damned right I play it safe. If you can't make the big decisions, Commander, I suggest you make room for someone who can. Indeed, the best of both worlds is remembered to this day for how it threatens to shake up TNG after Picard is captured and assimilated by the Borg into Locutus. The season three cliffhanger leaves the audience wondering if Picard will come back at all. Mr. Worf, fire. As you can probably tell, I didn't go into as much detail about every single episode in this video. Originally, I shot it as a combo video where I discussed seasons three and four together, but that was gonna be like an hour long, and I just, I just didn't really wanna have to squeeze all that commentary into the runtime of a video that's the same as my Expanse video. Besides, I thought that splitting it up like this was more convenient for you guys, since you told me that you want to hear me talk about each season episode by episode anyway. While my commentary for season three is admittedly more concise, and I want to stress that this series, this recap series, has never been a review series, to the extent that I am reviewing these episodes, I just think that the writing is tighter in TNG Season 3. So I didn't have as much to say critically about each episode. Some one-off episodes still don't contribute much in the way of broader lore, but I didn't really see the point in reciting their plot beat by beat. So would I recommend skipping any episodes in Season 3? Well, 
honestly, not really. Probably the weakest episode of season three is the vengeance factor, but even this is still effective in exploring some of the serious themes that are present throughout all of season three. In any event, hopefully this video did serve as a thorough, thoughtful analysis and follow-up to my coverage of seasons one and two. And I hope you're looking forward to my coverage of the remaining seasons, which I would like to get to sometime this century. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and make it so.